Oh, it's been about three and a half years, and I've probably written around a thousand tracks now in that time. Um, I really I really went after it pretty hard, like, because <laughs> once I learned there was a, you know, a possibility I could make money, it was like, well, okay, <laughs> I should do this, I should give it a shot. Hi, I'm Don Bodan from SampleLibraryReview.com. I'm really excited to share this interview. I recorded this with composer Stephen McDonald. He's also one of the reviewers, contributors to Sample Library Review. If you don't already follow his reviews, be sure and check them out on the site. I get a lot of great insight from his reviews. And that's because he is a working composer, structured his life in a way that he can compose music, having hundreds of tracks out there in the world, licensed for TV shows, and he's also been making this transition over to trailer music, very exciting. He's got some credits with Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Aquaman. So in this interview, Steven shares with us a lot of details about how he got to the place where he is at as well as some of his tools and workflow and such. I'm just gonna stop talking. Let's jump in and put our learning caps on. Okay, Steven, thanks so much for taking some time today um, to talk to us. Really excited about your journey. Uh, for anybody watching, Steven's one of the more prolific contributors for Sample Library Review. Also has a extensive catalog licensing music for uh, TV, and films and commercials and whatnot. Um, and it wanted to talk to Stephen about his career arc, how he's gone from, uh, no offense, living in the middle of nowhere, uh, <laughs> Nobody. to creating uh, a large body of work that's in hundreds, if I'm not mistaken, hundreds yeah, of yeah. hundreds of television shows, things, hundreds of yeah, di different, yeah, most mostly TV shows, a couple of little. Probably a couple little ads here and there, but the vast, vast majority TV stuff. But yeah. As uh, just over the last couple of months, as I've seen uh, Stephen uh, look to get into music for trailers, he's um, landed some placement in the Ant Man and the Wasp promotion, which is very exciting. Yeah, really, really exciting, especially if you're from Taiwan and you actually got to see the the, the placement. <laughs> so before we get to uh, your music. Um, how you get started how, um, in TV and then transitioning to the trailers. How did you get started in music in the first place? Well, um, uh, in high school, I was uh, I was in marching band at my my school. I was the uh, I was the male clarinet player um, in in concert band, marching band, and all that stuff since since like fifth grade. So since I was about ten, uh, I just I did it because my brother. Did marching band and I was just like, okay, that's that's my extracurricular activity. Um, say around probably like my senior year in high school before I graduated, I started to really really enjoy it. Um, I specifically enjoyed marching band because of how like flashy and in your face it is. Um, and I started goofing off with with some you know like finale notepad, like the free finale you could get. Like, huh, I can actually put notes on this thing and make my own make my own thing. Uh, back then I was pretty convinced that what I wanted to do was be a composer for concert, like for a mark or most, I, we didn't have an orchestra. So back then it was all for me, it was all wind ensemble, uh, concert band. I was like, I want to write music for concert band and for marching band. Uh, when I started showing interest in that, my band director was pretty cool about it. Um, he let, he let, like I wrote a little crappy wind ensemble piece and he let us play it in class. Um, when I moved to college, off for college the next year, I learned uh, about sample libraries and the idea that I could actually make my own, you know, recordings, not have to, not have to go through all the work of sheet music and all that stuff, um, and that kind of just opened up the world to me uh, and made me realize I don't actually like making sheet music and uh, you know having to rehearse with kids and stuff like that. Uh, I, I was just like I, I wanted the instant gratification, um, so. In college, I spent a lot of time. I, I, I majored in film production, actually, um, because in my head I was like, well, that's a little more empl employable than music, um, even though it's still not very employable, uh, especially where I live. So I did a film scoring minor. That was the only thing I did with music in college. Um, and then I just spent a lot of time on forums, basically, like uh, VI Control, KVR Audio, Gear Sluts, a little bit, not much. And 
learned about learned about gear and learned about all the all the sample libraries and stuff out there. And for a long time, I just made music, uh, put it up. I would make like Halo inspired music. So I'm a big video game nerd. I you know play video games. That was kind of what got me into music in the first place. Um, play video games, make music inspired by them, put it on YouTube just for people to listen to, uh, and then just lucky something lucky happened and just one day someone who works for a music library that was just cruising youtube listening to music for inspiration heard something i did and emailed me out of the blue asking if i wanted to work for their little composer team so that was that was how it got started i had no idea what music libraries were or any of that stuff i didn't i had given up any idea of like having music as a career i i was working uh at a tv news station running camera there at the time, so um, that was pretty much that was it. I just some someone I got lucky. Someone found my music. Someone with some power found my music and liked it and uh, reached out to me. So yeah, that, you know that's pretty fascinating. I didn't know not I did not know that you studied film uh, at mm-hmm. film production. And I I actually often uh, when I'm talking to uh, younger composers, I I highly recommend you study film in whatever capacity you can uh, because. You, because as composers for media, we're really part of the filmmaking team, mm-hmm. and so often um, we don't have any idea what that process is, what the need for music is in the film production world, and so yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't know that you. Uh... Yeah, it, for me, like the video stuff is always something I did. Like when I was a kid, I would, I would like I learned how to I learned how to like rotoscope. And frame by frame, like add a lightsaber effect. So, like when I was a kid, I would record me and my brother fighting with sticks, and then go and make them into lightsabers and stuff. And I was just, I, was, I just thought all the tech was really cool. And so I, I majored in film, and uh, by some miracle, I actually did, you know, manage to have a job. I was employed in my in my industry, uh, in that industry before I started doing music stuff. But yeah, you know, it was just. I didn't think music would. I didn't want to. I didn't want to take a bunch of music theory classes for the most part. I didn't want to do like. I didn't want to keep playing clarinet in college. I didn't want to do auditions and all the music major stuff. So I was like, I'll do film and just do like the film scoring minor. So I get to take a couple. You know, I got to take a couple classes where I got to play with. I got to learn Logic Pro and play with DAWs and stuff like that. And that was more my speed, more than majoring in music would have been. from that found you from youtube videos i i assume was yeah. it yeah yeah just from like those i think it was from like a, a, a halo a fan-made halo 5 soundtrack video i did where i was where i wrote some music inspired by a, an upcoming game that was i think that was what the one he listened to <laughs> and then fast forward to now about how many tracks have uh have you created for music publishers and how long has that been in that process? Um, so now it's been about three and a half years since uh, I, three three years and eight months about since I since that guy reached out to me, um, and I've probably written I've never counted exactly, but I'm probably around a thousand tracks now, in that time. Um, I really I really went after it pretty hard, like because <laughs> once I learned there was a you know a possibility I could make money, it was like well, okay, <laughs> I should do this. I should give it a shot. So. No, that's fantastic, especially to see that opportunity and really go for it. And with a thousand tracks, you obviously really went for it. <laughs> yeah, I'd say a thousand tracks. And if I go back, if I was to go back and listen to them all today, I would probably be proud of about two hundred of them. But you know, <laughs> things change. <laughs> you know what better way to get uh, to get your production shops and. Um, open your eyes to different writing styles uh, than to do so many tracks. Yeah. Um, did you focus on a specific genre? I noticed in your bio you talk about uh, a range of inspiration from 8-bit chiptune video game music to orchestral epic orchestral music. Is there anything you focused on? Uh, yeah, when I when I first like started, before I knew about music libraries or anything, what I wanted to do was be a video game composer and 
uh, you know, like a lot of a lot of games these days, at least the ones I like, the big AAA games, big production value. You know, there's there's a big focus on orchestral music and orchestra, a lot of hybrid, you know, kind of the modern cutting edge stuff. And that was about all I was interested in uh, back then. Like the first sample library I ever bought was uh, East West Quantum Leap Symphonic Orchestra Silver. Uh, so I I just wanted like an orchestra and a uh, some drums, like maybe a couple synths. That was all I really cared about back then. And uh, it kind of worked out that when that guy, uh, when when the music supervisor that reached out to me was telling me about it, um, what he had me doing first was like tension elimination music for reality TV shows. So, you know, someone getting voted off the island, not Survivor, nothing that big, but you know, someone getting eliminated, you know, they had this, they use a lot of that trailer style music, you know, big, big drums, energetic, you know, tension building up to a big, you know, and that stuff was a little easier for me to, to that, so I was able to ease my way into that. Um, but then before too long, I was doing like hip hop comedy, indie rock, you know, all kinds of just stuff I never would have dreamed of doing just because I was like, okay, I'll try. <laughs> so, and the, the eight bit thing, it, that was funny. Cause that was when I, when I quit my full time job, like I wrote music, f I was doing, writing like five tracks a week with a full-time job for a year. And then well, I got my first royalty check after that year, um, and it sucked. It was terrible, it was really low, but I still I still quit and went part-time at that point to a different job. And once I did that and started kind of looking for my own clients, like the, the first client I found was some company that was making like retro video games, like actually like on, you know, like NES cartridges, like they would actually manufacture their own cartridges and stuff. It was really weird. And so I learned how to use like these old trackers, like Fama Tracker, to write actual like eight bit chip tunes. I had to, and I had to learn how to do that real quick. Like it was another another instance of just jumping in the fire. Like okay, I'll try. <laughs> so that was kind of where the eight bit thing came from. And then I found that a lot of people liked that style. And so I had a lot of little like you know super low budget indie games wanting chip tunes that I was able to kind of capitalize on. Capitalize on. So. Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like jumping into fire. Um, that's a, a continued theme, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say a lot of people talk about asking like, when did a composer get a big break? When they're interviewing a you know a big composer mm -hmm. like Hans Zimmer, you know, when did he get his big break? But uh, I find so many other composers I know, the opportunity is there, and if you don't jump into the fire then it's not a you don't have that break mm -hmm. you have to put yourself in that. yeah i mean like i don't want to give myself too much credit because obviously luck was a big part of you know that music supervisor finding my youtube channel but i will i i did say yes you know i could have easily been like oh this sounds scary i don't want to i don't want to do this but i was just like whatever i'll see what i can do <laughs> I mean, you know, since I've been transitioning more into trailer music, that's always been kind of my bread and butter, the, the modern cutting edge stuff. I'm not great when there's an orchestra involved. I've come to realize that when I use an orchestra, I just like, I create like artificial boundaries for myself that aren't real and I get less creative. So my favorite kind of stuff is just straight, you know, si sound design, electronic, you know, heavy stuff. But I've also written so much of that lately that I'm like, oh, I need to do something else. So it's... I'd say that I'd call that my bread and butter. You know, my my true love I'll always go back to. But you know, right now I'm really liking the the simpler TV stuff I've been doing too. It's just <laughs> it's nice to take a break every once in a while. So after doing a whole three year sprint of music for TV licensing, and then seeing uh, that you wanted to expand and and focus on working on uh, trailer pitches, trailer albums. Um, I know there's a, I know that there's a big difference in mindset, um, in production, in approach. What do you feel like those differences might have been for you? For me, it's always, I always have. To, I feel like I, I have to like walk on eggshells when I talk about this. It, I don't want to ever like devalue the the TV stuff I do, the reality TV stuff I do. Like obviously, it that is like ninety nine percent of my income now is is that stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I've had a couple of little trailer placements here and there, you know, nothing big. But that stuff, there's such a, a big demand for it, you know, as where, where you have, like, one trailer, you know, we have, like, 
a thousand composers fighting for one trailer placement. Um, it's a little more sparse. There are lots of composers in the TV world, but there's also just a huge demand. Like there's there are so many shows that need to fill you know an hour of music per episode, and that stuff has been more uh, quantity versus quality. Um, I started doing like I've basically been making myself do five tracks a week for uh, for the TV stuff. And there are times where I, I have done all five of those tracks in one day, like one just marathon day. And it's like, I could never do that with trailer music. You know, with trailer music, I'm looking at like, usually like two days of work, two solid days of work for one track. Kind of, that's kind of the average. It, you know, it, it fluctuates, obviously. But the the TV music, you, when you think about how it's used, like it's played on, I, I know, I don't think the average TV viewer has like, a great big sound system and all that stuff. They're just watching on their TV speakers. Um, you know, it's way in the background, just, you know, just mood setting stuff. It's not featured very heavily. And, um, the only reason I would say this, I mean, obviously everything you write, you should, you should try to make it the best you can. But, uh, with, when I'm writing trailer music, I will sweat over the details and labor over the details a lot more than when I'm writing TV music where, you know, I'd be like, this track is, it's fine, you know, it's serviceable, it, it sets the mood. Um, I can call this one finished and move on to the next one a lot a lot more a lot more easily than with trailer music where I'm like, oh, this has to be, like, amazing, you know. And I, I've had tracks placed, you know, like, the very first few tracks I wrote for, for my TV publisher were just, I go back and listen to them now, I'm just like, oh, God, I didn't know how to mix back then. I didn't, like, but, you know, that track is super low volume in the background, it was fine, you know, they're good enough, they still get used, you know, it's, so it's just something I had to, I think, and I think that's one of the biggest struggles a lot of composers have is, one is like perfectionism, which is good in most cases, but there are some times where it's just, you got to get tracks out the door if you want them to get used, and if you want to start making money, so that's the mindset. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that is the mindset, um, I'm, I'm glad. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, one thing that I started to think about while you're talking about that is that um, writing music for uh, TV placement versus trailer, there's a whole different set of influences, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for me, there was when I, when I first started looking into trailer music. Um, do you draw on, do you watch a lot of trailers? Do you listen to a lot of YouTube trailer music channels. Uh, what, how do you keep up and and uh, absorb that influence? I am I'm a big trailer fan. I'm like I always have been, just kind of like a hype junkie. Like I love the months leading up to a, a big game release or a big movie release. Like watching trailers over and over, analyzing them and everything, and coming up with tra <laughs> like my own trailers in my head. You know, like after a movie is released, I'll be like, now I would have used this scene, and like you know, you know, in my head, that's just always something I've done. Um, I don't, I don't listen to a lot of, I don't really have time to listen to a lot of music on my own. Um, I'll listen to, you know, obviously when I'm working on a project on a brief, I'll listen to the references, you know, analytically. Um, and then that, that, you know, that's for the trailer stuff. I watch a lot of trailers. I listen to the references some, and, uh, that's how I kind of keep up and, you know, I, I don't want to like, this, this sounds like an excuse, but then you could also be like, oh, I don't want to listen to too many other people's music or I'll just you know, copy people, maybe, even though, you know, that is kind of how it works in the trailer industry. There's, there's a specific sound that is really common. And, uh, with the TV stuff though, it's pretty much just references for me, listening to reference tracks that, I, that the publisher sends me for certain projects, because, um, it's funny, actually, the publisher I work with was founded by, like, a, uh, a big pop producer, uh, that had, like, done, and I, I don't remember. I think he had done like records with Jay Z before and stuff. And they're big on the pop sound. Like they do a lot of Bravo shows that use pop and hip hop. And um, I kind of became their go-to like more cinematic guy, where I'll do more of the trailery stuff and the more modern avant-garde stuff. But I also have had to learn a lot of pop and hip hop techniques. And um, I never listen to pop music really, except for like when my wife and I are on a road trip of some kind, and she'll she'll play her favorite pop music and I'll listen to it. Um, but most of the time it's just references for me. I'm not a, not a really big listener. I have a couple artists that I really, really like. Um, but 
not very mainstream generally. So, yeah, I, I keep up by watching trailers, listening to reference tracks I get sent, and uh, occasionally I'll just go out and listen to trailer music, you know, that I like, but that's not that often. So, uh, after years of cranking out five tracks a week for TV, um, how, how are you dealing with uh, tight deadlines for trailer pitches? Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> I, I, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't do a lot of the custom... I get a, I, like, I'm on several different email lists where I, and you know, different, with different publishers and stuff that have custom requests that are like, we need something like this in three days. And uh, most of the time I just, I don't do it because, um, you know, the stuff that has worked for me has been the library tracks, you know, sitting in a lot, sitting in a catalog and just getting placed over time. Um, but those big custom pitches can be like the lottery sometimes just with the amount of composers pitching and, and then, you know, they might use your music, but then that trailer gets axed completely. And then it's like, Oh, well I lost it anyway. Um, so I, that's kind of why I like the library industry is there aren't a lot of deadlines there. You know, when you're just writing tracks, I'll get some deadlines, nothing, you know, nothing ever super intense. And if the if there is a deadline that's too intense, I can just say, sorry, I can't do that. You know, it's work when I want. Um, and that's very important to me right now. Uh, I have a one year old and my wife has a full time job. So most of my work time is like, I can work when the baby takes a nap. Uh, so, you know, I'll work, I'll like, she'll usually take a nap around noon. So I spend the first half the day from like seven or 8 a.m. to noon, just playing with the baby, taking her out, doing stuff, put her down for a nap and then I'll work. And then my wife will get home around two thirty. Then I can work a little bit after that, but I'm not a, I'm, excuse me. I'm a big family, family first guy. And I very rarely work past like three or four on a day on any given day. Um, because I want to spend the, the evening with, with my wife, and then like, at seven in the evening I go work out too. I go to the gym too. So it's, I'm always trying to, like I, I I'm I'm not an overworker. I'm not a workaholic, and uh, I know that that attitude of you have to be a workaholic to survive gets spread around a lot in this industry. But um, I, it's not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think focus and working smartly uh, always beat grinding the midnight oil mm -hmm. is that the word burning the midnight oil yes, that's what yes, it is yes, yes. yeah and i know you, you talked earlier a little bit but when we talked before recording you said you don't like you don't you don't lose sleep over composing and like the same yeah same like I, i've never in here late at night you know while my wife's asleep like headphones on grinding away like yeah i at this point i basically work part-time um which is I'm really lucky to have the opportunity to be able to do that. It's great because I get to be with my daughter a lot and with my wife a lot. But, um, I, you know, I, I had to work really hard to get here, though. Like like I said, like I had three years of working a job plus doing, you know, working a day job plus doing all this stuff. And I've been day job free for about six months now just, just doing music. So music. That's fantastic. Yeah, I... I uh... I, rare, I, I don't do any all-nighters mm -hmm. simply because um, I've found long ago uh, that lack of sleep is is much more detrimental for the following two or three days for me mm -hmm. uh, than if I just go to bed and get up a little bit earlier, you know? Because a lot of times I'll get up between 5 and 6.30 yes. to knock a project out. That's great. Uh, That's a great feeling. That's a great feeling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And especially if I, you know, if I do work in the evening, uh, then... Uh, I'll have that sleep to rest my ears and come back mm -hmm. uh, and sit down in the studio and be, and listen and be like, okay, good, I was on the right track. And I um, and sometimes, you know, some of my clients are in Europe and they change their mind while I'm sleeping yeah. anyway. So <laughs> by the time I get back to it, I got some new directions. Yep, yep, that's the thing that definitely happens to the time zone. All these publishers in different parts of the world. So this might be an odd question, but it's something I sent over to uh, kind of get your feel mm -hmm. for it. What role do you think failure has played in your reaching your goals thus far? Uh, I, I guess for me, failure would be all the many, many, many times I have reached out to a publisher I, I wanted to work with and not heard back. 
or or heard back. Hey, we listened, but you suck. Well, oh yeah, no, no one's that. No one's that. Uh, you know, they're all very polite. Um, it just it, that those are the times where I'm like, okay, I need to learn. I need to get better, and that those are the times where I will go and you know, after I get rejected by a client or a or a uh, publisher, I will be like, okay, I have to admit that I'm not that great. So I'll go and listen to a bunch of music in the genres I want. That's when I'll go and like listen to an audio machine album or something to you know to work on trailer production and or I'll I'll watch you know I'll watch some YouTube tutorials do whatever other little things I can do to learn and failure is just kind of it's just a motivator to learn so that I don't fail again next time um, but yeah that's I guess yeah, not much more to say about it I, I fail I fail I don't want to fail next time so then I try to improve that's yeah and I think most people would say that too uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, most people who have reached a place where they're making a good income from music definitely have to find a way to deal with rejection mm-hmm. um, or failure or however we're going to frame the topic. Uh, I've always kind of, uh, um, I'll be like, I can usually be very upset for about 45 minutes. <laughs> and, yeah. And yeah. then and then my uh, my rebellious punk rock background comes out and... I'm going to show whoever whoever rejected me <laughs> with my other avenues because at this point I've been rejected so many times but have still gone on to continue to create music for, you know, hundreds of different yeah. uh, projects. I think I'm like you. I, th- I think I think I'm like you in that same way like I'll get really pissed for a short amount of time and instead of like instead of just like slowly simmering over days, I'm just like no, oh, this sucks. Be sad for a little while. Go eat a cookie, and then next time I sit down, I'm like, okay, let's get. Yeah, better. or if I <laughs> if I can time it to go, just go to the gym, yeah. then it's yeah, everything's better. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to get yeah. back. <laughs> Channel the rage. Channel the rage. Uh, how do you think about uh, the difference between your success thus far with luck, talent, and hard work? Um, they all. They're all necessary elements. They're all pieces of the puzzle. All three of those things. Um, for me, like, I can definitely say the biggest instance of luck was my my start. Period. Was that someone found my music and reached out to me in the first place? That was you know that was pure luck. I mean, you could argue that I had to have written some music in order for it to be found. Yeah, sure. But um, there was nothing I could do to control the circumstances. You know, to control what what YouTube videos that guy would have clicked on and. Um, and that was pure luck and I, you know, I know that doesn't happen to everybody and it, it won't happen to most people, which sucks. You know, there's, I know I'm not that great of a, of a composer, that great of a producer. Um, but I've been in the right situation enough times, like I've been in the right place in the right time a few times and I have worked hard to capitalize on that. And that's the big thing is like, you have to be ready once the luck happens to take off with it and hold on and not let go because there were a lot of times where I was like why am I doing this still you know that first the first year doing library music um unless you're one of like the lucky people who have who's working with a library that still pays up front a lot um you know you have you get no money for that guaranteed like the first year because uh, you write a music you, you write a music you write a track you write some music um then it gets used in a tv show you know, while, while they're editing it, then it, it then it airs a couple months later, and then the royalties from that take nine months after. So you're looking at like a year at least before you might see any money, and that was hard to keep myself. It was really hard to con- to keep convincing myself. Yeah, I need to keep writing five tracks a week, even though I was working a full time job at the time and making zero money from music. And then when I got my first royalty check, it was like two hundred dollars. And those are, you know, every quarter. I was like, oh, this is three months of work right here. Well, it was, this is a year of work, but this is supposed to cover, you know, three more months until I get the next one, and it's $200. Why am I still doing this? You know, but then just persevering, I think that's the hard work part. Uh, Talent is kind of a, I don't really know how to talk about talent. I mean, I don't want to say I'm talented. I just really, really like music and want to, I really want, you know, I want to work hard at it, and I do, and I, 
I don't have much to say about the talent thing. I don't know. I've always been a I've always been a music guy. Some people have called me talented. You know, my wife calls me talented. Um, but I know there are people way, way, way better than me that um, that might be not making it. You know, <laughs> and that's the luck thing, or it might be the hard work thing. You know, maybe someone's super talented but just doesn't really care to work that hard, and then you know, there's a, those three things all have to kind of come together. I think. Have uh, have you had any other entrepreneurial uh, drive or business or experience at all before kind of just saying, I'm going to see what happens and make all this music and get it out there? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I I've uh, I shoveled someone's driveway once for 20 bucks when it was snowing, but I would say that's probably about it. And, uh, you know, before anything, before any of the music stuff happened, I was just like, my life plan was to just be content working some office job, generic office job, because especially once I realized I'm a film major, um, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be doing anything cool. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, you know, no, there's no creative industry really here. Uh, I still managed. I, I I was lucky enough to find work still in that in that field, um, but I was just like, oh, I'll just I'll just work I'm like everyone else. Come home and complain about my job, and then take a vacation every once in a while or something. And yeah, I I've never I'm not I'm really not an ambitious person. Like I don't do the music thing for like I don't I'm not trying to change the world or get famous or anything like that. It's just um, I like music and right now I can I can do it on my own for myself. Work from home, be with my family a lot. So that's why I keep doing it for the most part. Yeah, no, those are great motivators. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny to hear too because everybody has their own different perspectives. I shoveled everybody's driveway. <laughs> uh, I I swept the parking lots at the gas station. I've I've had every job you could possibly imagine um, since I was like twelve. I think <laughs> I've always had. So it's it's I'm always curious to to hear what other mm -hmm. people think about uh, yeah. their role yeah. as an entrepreneur. Um, uh, one thing I do want to talk a little bit about, and, and we did cover this uh, in the Sample Library Review Desert Island DAW <laughs> post not too long ago, which were, if you were stranded on a desert island um, and could only take five sample libraries on your laptop with you, what would they be? Uh, you don't have to restrict yourself that much, mm -hmm. but could you tell us a little bit about what some of your favorite or go-to libraries that you're really loving right now are? Uh I think it's safe to say my absolute favorite is Omnisphere, uh, Omnisphere 2, and just the whole synth sample library hybrid thing, and the wealth of presets, which I'm not against using, um, That that's number one for me. Like, there's so much music you could write only using Omnisphere. Um, I don't know if this counts or not, if it's just assumed that we have contact uh, on this desert island, but the Contact Factory Library has bailed me out countless times. Um, Back before I started contributing, before I started working with you on Sample Library Review, um, I'm I'm notoriously cheap. I very rarely bought things, and uh, I had to dip into that factory library a lot for you know for for more like rock or pop stuff for, that I had no that I didn't have covered otherwise. But you know, I think people overlook that. But uh, in the right circumstances, factory library is is great. Great. Um, another thing, more recent. Uh, I didn't have Albion 1 until about seven or eight months ago. Um, that's great for the kind of the kind of work I do, the library stuff for like writing quick a lot of tracks really fast because there's all the loops and stuff in there. And then the I, I love good, a good a good string ensemble patch, you know. And <laughs> I used to be a you know have all, always have my violin, violas, cello, the basses, but was, I, I've gotten to where I'm just like. Yeah, three or four ensemble patches, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> for the most for most situations, um, Albion One was definitely one of those. And then I would need. I'm big on I'm big on just, as you you can probably you can tell from those three. I'm big on the things that cover a lot of ground, like the big you know super specialized libraries. Don't I've you know I don't pick those up much, but. You know, with, with Omnisphere, Contact Factory, Library, Albion One, there's a lot you could do. Um, and then I would say you'd be missing some like good, really good percussion. 
I, I really have always liked Heavy Ocity's just Master Sessions drums, too. And recently I got the new Audio Imperius Herberus, which is great for the trailer stuff. So, I don't know. I don't remember what my list was for the Desert Island Daw thing, but somewhere in that ballpark. <laughs> yeah, that, that's okay. You didn't have to repeat the same ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's always changing, it like... Yeah. Week to week, mm -hmm. uh, the the Audio Imperia Cerebus review uh, will be up soon. Mm -hmm. You've turned that in, and it's in the the sample library review. Engineering monkeys are working on it, so <laughs> they'll the they'll have it up soon. It'll be exciting to read. Um, another question I try to ask everybody I talk to is, what's the best purchase you've made of anything, whether it's for your music world or personal life, under a hundred dollars or around that in the last few months. Okay. When I saw when I looked at this list of questions, I I only thought of music stuff. So <laughs> now I'm like, oh crap, it doesn't have to be just music. Um yeah. Um I'm just going to go the music route for now because I will sit here and make this face forever thinking about it. If I don't, uh I bought Native Instruments uh Session Guitarist Electric Sunburst. Um, and that thing is awesome. I think it was 89 bucks or 99 It was very close to that. Um, that is great. I am an, I'm not a guitar player. Never owned a guitar or anything like that. I don't know anything about guitars. Um, but Sunburst has got a lot of... Tons of amazing phrases and uh, loops. And it's got strumming patterns. It's got riffs. It's got arpeggio patterns. Uh, and it's got a really, really, really good um, amp it's got a bunch of good presets for the amps. Um, so, it's like, I don't know anything about amps, so those presets are amazing to just pick. It's got a really, really, really great sound, and, you know, I, I wasn't sure about it at first because it's, you know, it's all loops and stuff, but they're, the loops are very easily programmable with, you know, like, they change based on your chord and everything, and that's I've used that in everything from trailer music to, like, just, you know, like, little muted plucks in, a, in the background of a pop underscore track, you know, the boom, 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 boom. It's... It's great. It's, it's very, very flexible, and that's definitely probably the best music purchase I've made in a long time. That's good to hear. I, I have not... Uh, I haven't got a copy of it, and I haven't checked it out, so I would, I've seen it's it. Good. I'm, it's good. I mean, I see, awesome. I see guitars in the background there, so I'm guessing you're a guitar player in some, in some way. Yes, yeah, I, w I came up as a guitar player. So, it probably, I mean, it's probably hard to beat that if you're a guitar player already, but for me, it, Sunburst was awesome. <laughs> Um, then the last thing I wanted to ask you, it's more personal, but I, I, I always like to get a little, to know a little bit about the people I get to talk to. Uh, are you a coffee, tea, beer, wine, or some other thing that I haven't listed here? Uh, water. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny you'd ask that. I, I, I don't drink. Um, I am 26 and I've never had a sip of alcohol in my life, except, except for the time at, uh, a Japanese hibachi restaurant when they were like spraying sake in people's mouths. Um, but that was, <laughs> yeah, that was, I was just, I was just participating there, but, um, uh, I don't drink. I never have. It's just never been something I've really been interested in. Um, I've always considered myself pretty good at making my own fun. And, um, at first it was cause my, like my parents didn't want me to drink. Uh, but then as I got older, I was just like, every time I tell someone that they're really blown away by that, that I was like, you're like, what, you're 26 and you've never had alcohol? So I, now it's just my thing. I just keep it going <laughs> for, for fun. <laughs> That's nothing like, I don't have anything fundamentally against it. You know, I, my friends drink, my, I know my brother drink, my brother and my sister, they, they'll drink some from time to time, but I'm like, I'm just, I like it. And I, when I met my wife, I was 22, she was 21. She was the same way. So we've kept that going together. Um, coffee will be like, if I, if I really need it, uh, like if the baby kept me up all night, then I will have some coffee that morning. Just, I don't even know if it works, honestly. I think my base energy level is always so high that like caffeine doesn't actually work on me. But <laughs> I'll drink it even if just for the placebo effect to feel like, yeah, I have more energy. Um, and then tea's okay. Just I usually just I usually drink water. I got it's it's hot out here right now. Uh, I work out quite a bit. Got to stay hydrated. And water has been water's water's a good one. Water's been very good to me. <laughs> yes. Well, great. I, I really appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day to share, you know, a little bit about your journey. I know that um, all the different people who watch the, the videos have been messaging about uh, composers 
talking with different composers for the interview series, and, and I just thought it was a great opportunity, to, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, I, I appreciate you. It was, it was really great getting to talk to you, and I appreciate you asking me. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll say one more thing about, uh, a little thing about my little, my journey. This, uh, something I, I kind of managed to not mention, which is weird for me, but uh, my wife is, like, probably, like, the number one reason I'm able to do this right now. Um, she is the best person I know, the greatest, like, my biggest fan, biggest supporter. Uh, when I, you know, do you think that, if you think about the stereotypical, like, American family, you have, like, the hardworking dad, the, the you know, coming home, sitting on his recliner, like, oh, I worked all day. Um, but, like, my wife's really great, really talented. She works hard. She kept a full-time job. She's always had a full-time job since I've known her, and she was extremely encouraging of me to quit my old jobs and pursue this. Like, she would not have accepted me giving up on this, so. Um, and then, also as a uh, less sentimental and more and more just cynical view, uh, you know, having a, having a working wife is, you know, a great, great passive income to help when you're on your journey, but, <laughs> but, you know, uh, Real talk is, you know, she's amazing and, and she's, yeah, probably the biggest reason that I'm able to do this is because of her support early on whenever she was my sugar mama and I was, you know, the struggling musician trying to trying to get off the ground. So, so. that's it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Having, having both the emotional support and camaraderie and companionship uh, as well as uh, somebody else helping you make sure the electricity stays on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Great. Well, thank you so much. I'll include links to everything I talked to uh, uh, Stephen about in the description below. Thanks for, right. thanks for your time, Don. Thanks for your time, Don. Thank you.